the first and only ever commissioner of the NHL. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Bettman. Yay! Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and I think it's great to be with you. I'm getting used to the look of one of our sweaters without sleeves. I do like it, though. Ooh. And I love the fact that you have your Hockey is Awesome segment. Okay. Kamish, two things. I cut this myself, so I apologize for kind of disrespecting <laughs> no, one great. of the tarps. I do like I like the way I breathe out here. But if I was ever get on the ice, that thing would be all the way down. I'd have the elbow guards. I'd have the thing. Mm -hmm. I'd do the thing. I would do it all. I grew up in a hockey town. Very lucky oh. to say that. I think a lot of people uh, that are from hockey towns would say the same thing. So the hockey is awesome segment is just a very natural thing for me because there's a lot of people that don't know the sport, which leads me to this conversation. How do we continue to grow? I know you've been the commission's 19, what's that? 1993. Three. Hey, congratulations. Wow. That's, that's incredible. They, they, they're going to keep me at this until I get it right. Well, <laughs> hey, we're continuing to build. It feels like we're in the middle of a boom right now for the we popularity are. of the NHL. How do we continue that? What are some things you think that you guys are focused on to get this game in front of more people because it's the best game on earth? Actually, the attention that we're getting, particularly from ESPN, uh, both for the promotion and, and production of our games and how they're being carried and scheduled has been great. The Frozen Frenzy was a good element to that. Uh, our attendance, we're tracking for a record year on attendance. And we try to do things, whether it's at the grassroots level or I just came from a press conference announcing the public sale of one of our outdoor weekend events. We're going to put on two outdoor games at MetLife Stadium on February 17th and 18th. Tickets went on sale this morning. The Devils are going to be playing the Flyers on Saturday night, and there'll be a concert as part of that evening. The Rangers are going to play the Islanders on Sunday afternoon. The Giants and Jets have been great in sharing their home with us. And so we want to continue to create ways for fans to connect with our game and have a great experience. In addition to that, we've been using technology, puck and player tracking in particular, to bring people closer to the game, inside the game, and create more data around the game. But things like today and what you do with the Hockey is Awesome segment, that helps grow the game, and we really appreciate it. Now, I am a small doofus in this entire thing who happens to love... Hardly. Yeah, well, <laughs> I appreciate that. Hey, you're all right by me, Kamish. I'll tell you that. But let's talk about that. I appreciate the kind words and acknowledgement, but lucky to do it. Let's talk about that stadium series. That felt like a brilliant concept from the very beginning. Obviously, Pittsburgh Penguins have been a part of a lot of them. Whenever you go to a stadium outside, it's a spectacle. There's more people. It's a different view. You introduce that sky cam, drone cam thing. Whenever you see the success of the stadium series, what is the next steps of it, and how do you continue to make it special? I feel like that MetLife, this is a brilliant festival weekend, almost, of the stadium well, series. Met, the MetLife games will be outdoor games number 40 and 41, I think. Uh, they're all sold out. They're all unique. We dress up the stadium, whether it's a football stadium or a baseball stadium, and it becomes unrecognizable because it's very hockey centric and it's themed based on the area and the history and tradition of hockey in that area. Uh, what, what's really great about it is the players love it. It conjures up notions of them as young kids learning to skate outdoors on outdoor ponds. And for fans, it's there's tailgating, which you don't typically have for an arena sport. And we're coming together in numbers that you're not quite used to because, you know, we play in front of 18, 20,000 people in an arena. But when you put 80,000 people outdoors together, braving the elements, it, it's, it's, it's really taking the game back to its essential roots. And people just love the experience and dealing with the climate, which takes sports, which is the ultimate reality show, in our case, taking it outdoors and making it even more unpredictable. I was in Edmonton on Sunday where we played uh, the Flames against uh, the Oilers in the Battle of Alberta, which is a 40 some odd year old rivalry. And the fans, it was sold out with something like 55,000 people. It was 20 degrees out and it was just awesome. Yeah, it's beautiful. And also the jerseys that get made for the special event. It just feels yep. big. You know, the NBA's... And, go ahead. 
No, no, and, you know, we're going to do a fan fest outside MetLife. We're going to have a concert on Saturday night, probably before the game itself, not just during the intermission. It, it's really a celebration of the sport. And hockey in New York, you know, you've got the Devils, the Rangers, the Islanders. We've brought in the Flyers, so 90 miles down the road. Great rivalries, and hockey is so big at all levels in this area, you know, not just at the NHL level. Youth hockey is exploding as well, and that's another way that the game is growing. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit because I think the NHL, what you guys do with expansion teams, should be the standard barrier in, in every a standard bearer in every other sport. You expand into new cities. Most recently, obviously, Las Vegas. They go on to win the Stanley Cup just five years later. You have the expansion draft, and you get great players in there. You're at 32 teams right now, obviously. Is that... Where do you feel at uh, 32? Are we expanding more? Are we doing? Because it feels like that's been a home run for the NHL. And how do we get more hockey towns? So that, that, that's a great question. And I have to answer it two different ways. One, uh, the success that, that Vegas and Seattle have had is actually no coincidence. You know, our competitive balance based on our system of the salary cap and revenue sharing gives us the most extraordinary competitive balance. You see it in the races in the regular season to who makes the playoffs. I mean, every one of our regular season games has meaning in terms of getting into the playoffs. And then once you get into the playoffs, as we see, anything can happen. And so we made the decision, the owners made the decision, unlike typical expansions in every other sport, including our own historically, is you, you admit a new team, you give them a mediocre draft, and there's initial enthusiasm for three, four years, but the losing gets old. And then 10 years out, the team gets competitive. We decided because of our competitive balance, we didn't want to bring in teams that couldn't be competitive. Bill Foley predicted, the owner of, of the, the Golden Knights, that he would bring a Stanley Cup to Vegas within six years, and he did it. Um, Vegas has turned into a great sports town and hockey town. We were the first ones in. Uh, people ridiculed us at first. They thought we were nuts. Uh, but we always <laughs> believed that Vegas, which at the time I think was the largest city without a major, one of the major four sports there, and people wanted to have a professional sports experience. And now everybody else is gravitating. Obviously, the Raiders came. Baseball's going to come. The yeah, NBA is talking gone. about it. That's I mean, imitation, there. I suppose, is the <laughs> highest form of flattery. In terms of moving forward, we, we, we get expressions of interest all the time. We're getting it from Houston, Salt Lake City, Atlanta, Quebec City. Expansion isn't on the forefront of what we're thinking about. I take meetings all the time. I listen to expressions of interest. I'm not ruling it out, but it's not something we're focused on or we're pushing to do right now. So there We is like where we are. We think we have a good balance. And, you know, it also makes us a little bit different in terms of the competitive landscape and even television ratings, seven of our franchises are in Canada. And so our footprint is a little smaller in the U.S. than the other three majors. But we think we're doing just fine, and all of our franchises are stable, healthy, and competitive. Well, there's one out there in the desert, obviously, that everybody has to talk about. But Phoenix is like top five city in the country, and yep. it's... it's that city's beautiful. Yeah. People, I mean, it is obviously a fantastic place. But that's a big focal point, I think, whenever these new cities are talking about how they would treat hockey if they were to go. We were just in Salt Lake this past weekend, and I know it's been brought up. The people, like the hockey is awesome segment that we do, the amount of people that came up and were like, hey, we love hockey here in Salt Lake. That hockey is awesome segment is up there. And I'm sure they're not the only city, but that city felt like, and we went to the Jazz game, 251 straight sellouts 18,000 people in that place. It's like those cities see what's happening in Phoenix and they think it's a crime almost. How do you fix what's going on with the Coyotes and how do you kind of see that going, Kamish? The Coyotes need a new arena. It's that simple. Uh, and, and you know, to go through the history of how they got into the situation they are is, is an interesting and would take too long. But the point being, the current owner, Alex Morello, is committed to getting what he needs done in order to get them a new arena. And our, hopeful, our hope is that sometime this season we're in a position to announce that there will be a new arena for the Coyotes coming out of the ground. That's the goal because, as you said, it's an awesome market. It's top five or close to it. 
And it's a place we want to be, and they're great fans of hockey and of the Coyotes, and we're hoping to work it out. Having said that, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't do well, uh, perhaps with expansion in the future, in a place like Salt Lake City, where we know there's tremendous interest. Yeah, it's fa- you're in a good spot, it feels like. The NHL is in a very good yeah. spot. We, we've probably never been healthier as a sport. The game has never been not only more competitive, but more entertaining and more exciting. Great young players. You recently had two on, on your show yeah. uh, with Bedard and Matthews. Uh, the skill, the speed, the entertainment value. As important, something that I track is we're, I think we're trending to set a record from come from behind victories. Lead changes were a team that was losing that comes on to win, and it's, it's getting close to 50% of our games, which makes it exciting and fun as a fan to be entertaining. And as a fan, you know, whoever you root for, your team likely has a chance of making the playoffs, uh, which most sports can't say. And then once the playoffs begin, as I said before, anything can happen. Our franchises are healthy. Well, uh, our ownership is strong. Uh, the sport has, on all of the metrics that are relevant, has never been in better shape. Uh, we like where we are, but there's always more to do. And we've got to keep moving forward to make sure the game is healthy, that we're relevant, and that we're connecting with our fans. Should I call you Gary, G, Mr. Bettman, Kamish? What should I call you? Gary, I like the best. Okay, Gary. Well, everything you just said was a lie about the Penguins. I've been told we're done this year. Yeah. I've been told we've stink. That's, that's what I've been told. But I appreciate where you're coming from because every game is electrifying. And you talk about how healthy the sport is, how healthy ownership is right now in the NHL. And we're all incredibly pumped because it wasn't that long ago, I guess two decades at this stage, the lockout happened. And I was doing some research on you because I'm very lucky to get a chance to chat with you. There are still some fans, I guess, that are very mad at Gary about the lockout. But I would like to say this. What did you learn from that experience? And how do you think the league has become stronger because of everything that happened then? We, we, we were fundamentally in a place, going back to 04, where the game wasn't entertaining, the players weren't having fun, there was no competitive balance. Uh, we wound up losing a season and collective bargaining didn't go very well. I wish it didn't take a full season to convince the union that we needed a new system. We got the system and that's what's opened up the game because when teams can compete and all of our teams can, it makes you play to win, not play not to lose. And that's why the game's gotten better. And what's interesting is, and I know there may be some people who still are upset about what happened. But when you look at the shape that the game is in now, there's no question that what we did, for lack of a better set of words, was worth it. But even when we came back from the year-long lockout, no sport had ever done that, uh, one, we set a record for attendance, we had record ratings, um, and we had great competitive balance. No business that I'm aware of shut itself down for a year and came back stronger than ever. And that's a testament to how great our fans are, how connected to the game they are, and the fact that they understood what we were doing and what the end result was. And what we're seeing now in terms of the health of the game is a function of we got the system we needed to make the game healthy. Hey, you should talk your shit on that, by the way, Mm -hmm. because sometimes some hard decisions have to be made. And in your seat, those ones are going to affect every single team or at least one team at it. And with where hockey is, I think everybody would accept the path that it took to get here, and it's only going to continue to grow. I think you should talk your shit on that, Gary. Tone has a question for you about growing the game. Yeah, I do. Mr. Gary, um, I lived in the same city as Sidney Crosby for 15 years, and I don't know anything about him. <laughs> and and uh, Con- Connor McDavid doesn't talk a ton. Austin Matthews was on the show, but... You don't hear the stars talk a ton in hockey because I feel like it's just part of who they are. They don't like to make it about themselves. They like to make it about the team and stuff like that. Do you wish the stars of the NHL talked more, put themselves out there more? Do you think that would help grow the game? That That's a great question. And I think historically, our, the, the culture of our game was more team-centric than individual centricity. And our guys are great on and off the ice. And the younger ones, and our teams are supportive of this, as is the league, younger players understand the importance because they are Gen Zs 
and they are now putting themselves out there on social media more than ever before. And it's something that we encourage. And yeah, when you look at the things that we've been doing, Road to the Winter Classic, you know, the Stanley Cup videos behind the scenes, we know that fans, particularly younger fans, want more insight into the game behind the scenes and more about our athletes and how great they are and how personable they are. And that's something we're encouraging and emphasizing. And I think in that respect, the culture of the game is changing and that's going to help grow the game as well. We've had, you're hundred percent right. It's just kind of been the culture. I feel like, like it's not about me. It's about the team, which is very noble. Awesome. It is very, very noble. But they also they also get the world that listen. They're younger too. They're part of a newer generation, and they're more instinctively out there on social media and you know the behind the scenes stuff that we do and what they're now doing on social media, which is now being encouraged. Uh, I think is one of those things that's going to help make fans appreciate the players more than they even do and help grow the game. I think there's people that are always going to be fans of the team. For instance, I'm always going to be a yeah. fan of the Pittsburgh Penguins because I grew up in Pittsburgh. My father was a fan of the Penguins. My father's father mm -hmm. was a fan of the Pittsburgh Penguins. But there's also a generation that is fans of humans and they're fans of the yep. people. So that anything that's going to bring them. Austin Matthews was great on our show. Yep. Shout out to Scottsdale, Arizona, by the way. Connor Bedard was great. P.K. Subban was fantastic. Patty Maroon has been on yeah. the show. He's been good. It's like there's a lot of great personalities. I'm excited we're getting to learn about them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And the more the more casual sports fans, not just hockey fans, get to know our players and the people associated with the game, the more they're going to love the game and feel connected to it. I'm a meathead, even though I was a punter from Pittsburgh. Father was a truck driver. Hardly. Hardly. Yeah, but yeah, go ahead. We'll, yeah. we'll play along. Okay. Hardly. You got it. You got it. But my dad, truck driver, you know, from Pittsburgh. Not scared, you know, every once in a while, if we have to, even though I was a guy that punted footballs. A massive part of hockey for a long time has been fighting, has been the acceptance of fighting, of like, hey, you disrespected or took a cheap shot on my guy. We are handling this right now. To be honest, I think society kind of needs that back in moderation in a healthy way is, instead of what we become now. I know that you guys have kind of leaned away from potential, the fighting being a major part of hockey. Is there a happy balance there? I think there's more fights this year than there's ever been. What do you think about it? And how do you guys view it going forward? Because for me, dipshit in a sleeveless hockey sweater here, like love it whenever he says, oh, you want to hit my guy? I don't think so. We're doing this. But I know there's people that feel differently. I understand that there's people that feel differently, Gary. There is a balance, so let's take a step back. First of all, when you think about the nature of the game, uh, it's high speed. Players are encouraged to make physical contact with each other. Uh, it's emotional. It's nonstop. And by the way, everybody's carrying a stick. Um, fighting in, in the spontaneous sense tends to act as a bit of a thermostat when things happen in the course of the game and it keeps the game under control. What's really come out of the game is, is the stage fighting and the designated fighter. And part of that is because the competitive balance is so intense, uh, teams have concluded you can't have a designated fighter anymore. What you really need is skilled players, and you don't want to give up a roster spot. 80% of our games don't have fight in, fights in them roughly. The other 20%, the, spot, the fights tend to be spontaneous in the heat of the moment. And I think the game's in a good place with that. We're obviously aware of health and safety concerns, and that's something we've been dealing with with the Players Association for decades. But I think right now we're in a good place. Yes, fighting is penalized, but fighting in, in the heat of the moment is something that has been a good outlet and we don't need the stage fighting anymore. And uh, I think the game's better without it. Hey, feels like that's probably the right answer, especially if I was sitting in your seat. But I'll tell you what, when the boys <laughs> form a circle oh. and he's got the sticks and they say, have at it, boys. You know, that's uh, your sport's the only one that has that. Your sport's the only one that it has happens. it. Yeah, it's going to happen forever, we would assume. Let's talk about safety of the game, though, because you just chit-chatted about that there at the end. Obviously, devastating thing happened in the hockey world devastating Horrible. and i know in the nhl and rest in peace by the way he was a penguin so we appreciate him mightily got hit with a skate in the throat now 
this is international, this is over in England, I do believe. There's a full conversation about did that guy do that on purpose and he has a little bit of a rap sheet doing this. Nonetheless, let's stay out of that. Let's keep with you, though. Rest in peace, Adam Johnson. Let's keep with the NHL. There has been a conversation of potentially wearing a throat protector because there is sticks and skates. Where do you fall on that, especially with what is happening recently in hockey? That's something that's been an ongoing discussion in terms of safety and equipment and Kevlar, whether it's for legs or wrists or the neck. And to the extent anything would be mandated, it's something that A, there needs to be the appropriate education and B, it's something we do in consultation with the Players Association. We, we have a standing committee that meets regularly and studies these issues. Uh, and this has been a topic of ongoing discussion, and it will continue to be. Uh, players are free to wear Kevlar protection uh, for the neck and, and whatever. And I think as part of the evolution, it's no different than what we did with visors. It took us a couple of decades to agree to make it mandatory, but more and more through education, players had increasingly been wearing visors. They were coming into the game from other places as they were youngsters, wearing visors and we continued to encourage them not to take them off and then ultimately we got to the point where we made it mandatory i think over time as we continue to work with the players association we'll get there as well and as i said there's nothing to stop players from better protecting themselves whether it's the the neck or or wrists or legs from wearing more protective equipment uh, and that's something we're going to continue to study and educate on uh, but I think it's part of the natural evolution. And what happened in Europe was nothing short of a horrific tragedy, no matter how it happened. Uh, and it's something that I think has raised consciousness. And, and in terms of the consciousness raising, uh, it, that the discussions are not a bad thing to happen. Absolutely devastating what happened over there, especially with hockey. But what I think a lot of us learned is, oh, they're playing leagues over there, mm -hmm. which leads to oh, AQ yeah. Shipley's question for you, Gary. Yeah, Gary. So obviously, the NFL's had a ton of success over in Europe. Has there been any yeah. talks? Obviously, you guys have done some stuff in the preseason, but has there been any talks of growing it more into Europe and having yeah. like maybe an international series over in Europe? We do that. We've been doing that. Uh, last year, we played in Finland. Uh, in November, we have four teams going to play in, in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, people tend to forget two things. One, that a third of our players come from outside of North America, and, and these are some of the most skilled, coveted players in, in the world, and the fans, the hockey fans in their native countries are always anxious to see them play in the world's best league for hockey, which, which is us, obviously, which is why we've been for, for years taking regular season games and some preseason games to Europe, and which is why we're doing it now. The other thing is, and we're very respectful of it, there are highly developed leagues in European countries, uh, Sweden, Finland, Czech, Russia. Uh, and, and so we're very respectful of the fact that they're developing world-class players and we want, try to work collaboratively to use our games in Europe to help grow interest in the game worldwide. And as I said, that's something that we're going to be doing again in November in Sweden. Uh, we just played two, uh, as a different aside, exhibition games in Australia, in Melbourne, in the preseason. So we, we are probably, in terms of the, the demographics of our players, the most international of the four major sports. Yeah, let's talk about the most international of the four major sports. I assume you have to deal with a lot of different international relations with a lot of these things. We do. Yeah. So we do. You, is that something you have to act, actively focus on, diplomacy, whenever you're dealing with, you know, you just talked about Russia. They're currently in a war. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some other stuff popping off. Like, how do you go about dealing with everybody's different cultures, backgrounds, and happenings currently to kind of run a, you know, a nice, we, we, nice league? We, we have to be respectful. Obviously, uh, after the war with Ukraine started, we cut off all of our relationships, commercial relationships with Russia, which would, which was many millions of dollars that we just stopped doing business with. And, and in terms of our international rate relations, we're very respectful at the governmental level of what our country tells us is permissible and impermissible. Uh, but we try to have relations with the federations that govern hockey throughout the world. We, we have 
a very strong relationship with the International Ice Hockey Federation, and we're trying to work together with the IIHF to get our players back into the Olympics because in addition to everything else that our players do that's important, the, they love representing their countries and they love international best on best, and we're going to try and make arrangements for Milano Cortina to get our players back into the Olympics. It's a logistic nightmare. It takes place in the middle of our season. It's very expensive, uh, but it's something that we're working on because it's important to our players. It's right in the middle of our season. With yeah. very, we, hey, mm -hmm. very important for yep. the game of hockey, too. A lot of people watching that that maybe don't watch the NHL because they're watching Team USA exactly. or their own country. But also, if this guy gets hurt, like in the International Baseball Series, yeah. or Buddy Blue is thing, that kind of affects us. But yes, we are trying to make it happen because... To, by the way, there, I pointed out that way, uh, and, and you're right the way you were sort of parroting me, but the fact is, it's hard. No, because I would. Hey, Gary, Gary, we, we, Gary, hold on. We, 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 was, we were supposed to go to the last Winter Olympics, and then COVID got in the way because we had to reschedule 150 some odd games, and we couldn't take the Olympic break. But the fact is, we do want to go because, first and foremost, it is important to the players. Listen, we don't make any money by going to the Olympics, and that's not the be all and end all. But the fact is, in the middle of the season, you don't see the other leagues willingly taking <laughs> yeah. that on yeah, I'd say. because it, it changes the momentum of the season. Uh, and, and because of the composition of our teams, our NHL teams, some teams may send one or two players to the Olympics. Some may say, send nine or ten. Coming back from a two-and-a-half-week break halfway around the world means whatever conditions the teams were in, the NHL teams, before the break, some are coming back well-rested, and some are coming back pretty tired. And that's something that impacts the season. Having said that, if we can make it happen with the IOC and the appropriate arrangements are, are made, we're going to go. Gary, I want to tell you, the only reason why I'm saying that is because I was one of the people that was like, why are they not mm -hmm. in the Olympics? Yeah. Like, it just seems like such an easy thing. I was very loud about it. What a dumb decision <laughs> by the NHL to do this. And then you just laid out like, uh, there's about a thousand reasons why it's very difficult, but we agree. We would like to be in there. So I appreciate that from you a lot. And also, I know you have a lot of things happening every single day. The fact that you just took 25, 30 minutes of your life to talk to these idiots in this particular room, we are so incredibly thankful, Kamish. I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you. I expect all of you to join me at the two games at MetLife the weekend of uh, February 17, 18. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> I hope you come as my guest. And I'm happy to join you anytime you want to have us on the show because I know you think hockey is awesome. I appreciate the hell out of you. The commissioner of the NHL, we'll see you out there too, by the way. Can't wait to see the spread in the commission. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Bettman. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, yeah.